the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 335, Acts 20, verses 1 to 6, and Romans 1 to 3. Always through Jesus. Paul, who was sure that the name of Jesus was precious treasure that could not be exchanged for any other thing in the world, confessed that he was indebted to the gospel. First point. During the three months Paul spent in Corinth, he wrote Romans and sent it to the Roman church. Paul's first missionary journey that he started with Barnabas had its base camp in Antioch, Syria. Then Paul went with Silas and then joined together with Timothy and Luke to spread the gospel during his second missionary journey. Afterwards, Paul continued with his third missionary journey. During Paul's third missionary journey, he spent two years in Ephesus and the whole of Tyrannus, where he made disciples. After that, he went to Macedonia to go to Corinth and then strengthened the Corinthian church. Paul then strategized how to go about his ministry further. Paul desired to widen the territories of the gospel and to ultimately go to Spain, which was considered the end of the earth at the time. What Paul wished to do was to fulfill Jesus' command and to become Jesus' witness in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In order to fulfill this wish, Paul needed the cooperation of the Roman church. During his three months in Corinth, Paul wrote a letter to the Roman church. And before leaving Corinth, he wished to visit Jerusalem once again. Paul had a vision to create a network with all the churches and then go to Rome so that he could go to Spain. Therefore, he planned to first travel to Syria. However, at this time, there was a group of assassins who were most determined to kill Paul and thus he had to find a different route. Second point, Paul's dream was for always to read to Jesus Christ. As Paul had never actually been to the Roman church, he introduced himself first, and the foundation of this letter was Galatians, which he wrote during his early ministry. Romans contains some questions about the gospel. First, who is Jesus Christ? Second, how can we become God's children? Third, what is God's righteousness? Fourth, what is the relationship between God's laws and the gospel? Fifth, what kind of life are Christians meant to live? In Romans, the expression, it is written, is referred to frequently. A very important and reoccurring theme in Romans is justification by faith. Another is the concept of service and servant. At the time of writing, Paul had completed his first, second, and third missionary journeys through God's grace. Furthermore, he had plans to go to Spain, which was at the time considered the end of the earth. Before doing so, Paul made plans to receive help from the Roman church. What Paul ultimately wanted was to proclaim that always lead to Jesus. Third point, Paul wrote that Jesus took the cross, resurrected, and then ascended into heaven, all in order to fulfill the laws and the prophets. Paul wrote to the Roman church, explaining that the gospel was something that had been promised since the days of the Old Testament, the promise of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Paul moreover explained that he was given apostleship by God in order to spread the gospel of Jesus to foreign nations. Paul revealed the reason as to why he was writing the letter to the Roman church. The first 
was because he was so glad to hear that they had accepted the faith. The second was because he hoped to visit them. The third was an explanation as to why he wanted to visit them. The fourth part explained why he was unable to go immediately. Paul went on to explain that the reason for his letter was justification by faith. What Paul wanted was to tell them of God's great salvation and grace. Fourth point, Paul declared that God's judgment did not discriminate the Jews or the foreigners. Paul outlined the sins of humans and then wrote of God's judgment. Paul clarified that God's judgment did not discriminate anyone. In other words, God's judgment did not differ for the Jews and foreigners, but rather focused on the deeds. Paul then explained the standards of God's judgment. It did not matter whether the Jews knew the law or not. What really mattered was whether they were implementing the laws properly or not. Although the Jews boasted that they had and knew the laws. If they did not keep them, then they were equally sinners. The mission of the Jews from the early days was to know God's laws and to lead others into God's light. However, they often only pretended to keep them. Thus, it was not about knowing the laws, but actually implementing them. Paul declared that no one could avoid God's judgment in the end. Here, Paul reported to Jeremiah's words that they were to engrave God's message in their hearts. Fifth point, Paul taught that God's laws were there in order to help humans realize their sins and to understand that they were under God's judgment. In Romans chapters 1 and 2, Paul proclaimed that all foreigners and Jews were sinners and that there was no righteous person. Thus, no one could avoid judgment. The only way this was possible was through believing in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Humans are unable to become righteous by the laws only. Thus, the laws are there to help humans realize that they are sinners, and that judgment awaits them. Paul followed up by teaching the Roman church about justification by faith. Paul explained that salvation could not be achieved through human actions, and thus we had nothing to boast about. Salvation by faith, however, was for all humans. Day 336, Romans 4-7 Adam's disobedience and Jesus' obedience Jesus, who gave his life for us, redeemed all our sins through His grace that was given to us as God's gift. First point, Paul and Matthew both used Abraham and David as an example to explain the whole Bible. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew wrote that Jesus' story was the entire summary of the Bible. Much like Matthew, Paul also introduced Jesus' story as the climax of the Bible, and used the example of Abraham and David to explain justification by faith. Paul first wrote about Abraham. No one can stand completely righteous before God. Paul declared that not even Abraham, who was the most righteous man of his time, was able to stand completely righteous before God. Paul's next example was David. Paul taught that even David confessed his sins and was able to be forgiven through God's great mercy. Thus, justification did not come purely from circumcision. What made Abraham righteous before God was not circumcision by itself, but because of his faith in God, meaning that the important thing was what circumcision symbolized. Paul thereupon taught the Roman church that Jesus' death and resurrection was what gave all humans hope. Second point, Paul explained that those who were considered righteous had peace, grace, hope, and love in their lives. Paul taught the Roman church 
what kind of life they ought to lead in order to be considered righteous by God. Paul ultimately stressed that all humans were able to be saved through Jesus' ministry of the cross. Paul used expressions such as when we were still weak and while we were still sinners. Thus, we were to be all the more grateful to God for enabling us to have a hope through the hope that He gave to us. While we were still sinners, God gave us His Son Jesus Christ as our solution. Through Adam's sins, all humans were to die, and through Jesus' death, all humans were open to eternal life. Third point, Paul summarized the entire Bible through Adam's disobedience and Jesus' obedience. Paul wrote that Adam's disobedience opened the path of sins for humans as well as death. However, Jesus' obedience opened the way for all humans to gain salvation and eternal life. Paul then taught what God's laws, which came before the gospel, meant. Ultimately, the laws were there to help humans realize and confess their sins and then come closer to salvation. Fourth point, Paul referred to Jesus as the standard to distinguish between an old and new person. Paul now taught about how Christians were to live as renewed people. Through Jesus' cross, we were able to receive forgiveness and become free. Our faith in Jesus Christ liberated us. Anyone could become a renewed person through faith in Jesus. However, this does not mean that we will never sin again. What we must do is to repent and to come before God and have a faith that God is always with us. Paul taught that as Christians, we must live a new life through Christ. Paul stressed that they were to no longer be servants of sins, but servants of righteousness. And so, Paul exhorted the Roman church to stay away from sin. He told them to be servants of Christ and to be righteous, and that this would give them eternal life. Fifth point, Paul declared freedom from sin, freedom from death, and now freedom from the law. Anyone who believes in Jesus must turn from the laws and serve Jesus. This did not mean to say that the laws no longer mattered. The laws remained holy. The laws also had a role in making us understand that we had to stand before God and be judged. However, the laws were no longer the governing factor. Believing in Jesus meant that they no longer had to be bound up in chains. Jesus had freed all humans through his crucifixion. Paul taught the Roman church that they were now at the liberty to be free from the laws. Paul stressed that with Jesus' ministry, they were no longer under the law. Everyone was invited to salvation through Jesus. Thus, the role of the law was to help one realize their sins. Through Galatians, Paul taught that the laws were an elementary step into the gospel. Day 337 Romans 8 to 11. Paul's righteousness through faith. Nothing in the world can separate us from the love of God and the present affliction cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in the future. First point. Paul explained that despite the human sin, justification by faith means that anyone can become God's children. Romans chapter 8 has its core in justification by faith. Paul proclaimed to the Roman church that Christians were free from sin and death. The greatest privilege for Christians was that the Holy Spirit was always with them. Paul wanted to share with them the joys of becoming a child of God and the joy of living for God's glory. Paul declared that all this became possible through God's love. 
Paul then taught the church about the spirit of life and the spirit of death, the lives of those who only believed in the loss and death by sin were as follows. First, they only considered their days on earth. Second, the physical body is bound to decay. Third, they become the enemy of God from their disobedience. Fourth, they cannot become a joy to God. Fifth, as they do not have God's Spirit with them, they cannot become Christians. This life was indeed comparable to one who believed in the spiritual life after death. First, they considered their spiritual life. Second, their spirit was at peace. Third, they were a joy to God. Fourth, they lived with God as Christians. They could live as God's creation, and through justification by faith, they could live giving glory to God. Thus, as children of God, we must be prepared to receive glory along with persecution. Second point, Paul proclaimed that the present persecution was incomparable to the glory for Christians in the future. Paul taught the Roman church about their current hardship and the glory of the future. In other words, Paul was teaching them about how the current persecution would be transformed into eternal glory. The reason Christians would succeed was the following. First, God saved us through Jesus Christ. Second, God enabled us to become righteous. Third, Jesus who resurrected from death is looking out for us. Thus, Paul confidently confessed his faith. Here, Paul reported to the words of Isaiah. Paul had absolute faith that Jesus would help them succeed. Third point, both Moses and Paul expressed a deep love for their people. The reason why Paul so earnestly wanted to collect funds and to send to the Jerusalem church was because he had a great deal of love for his people. However, salvation did not privilege the Jews in any way. God not only saved the Jews, but was able to save the whole world. And he proved this through giving us Jesus Christ for the whole world. Paul, who realized this, could not help but have the desire to spread this truth to the whole world. Moreover, Paul wanted his people to know this whatever the cost. Paul went as far as to proclaim that he would rather be cast and cut off from Christ for the sake of his people, those of his own race, the people of Israel. This concern was similar to that of Moses. Fourth point, Paul taught that accepting the gospel meant accepting Jesus as the Messiah and believing in Jesus' cross and resurrection. Paul wrote to the Roman church that he wished for the Jews to be saved. This revealed Paul's honest state of mind. Paul looked at the Jews who believed that they were doing well, when in actual fact they were being hypocritical. At this time, the Jews had their roots in the laws of Leviticus. Paul knew that a person could not gain eternal life only through the laws. After teaching the Roman church about righteousness of faith, he then taught them the gospel. The gospel was accepting Jesus as Christ, believing in Jesus' death and resurrection, and furthermore, believing that the gospel did not discriminate. Paul used Moses and Isaiah, who were symbolic of the law, to once again teach the Jews about their neglect of the gospel. First, he wrote about Moses. Next, he wrote about Isaiah. Fifth point, Paul proclaimed that although he was spreading the gospel to foreigners, God's grace was still with the Israelites. In order to explain to the Roman church about the remnants and their salvation, Paul firstly used himself as an example. Paul explained that at first he also neglected the gospel but came to believe in salvation. 
Paul then used the example of Elijah and the seven thousand to once again speak of the salvation of the Jews. Here Paul reported to the recorders in 1 Kings. Thus Paul had faith that there was still remnant. Paul here explained that although his spreading of the gospel was targeted at the foreign nations, he still believed in God's grace for the salvation of the Israelites. Paul moreover added the unfortunate state of the Israelites. Paul wrote that the gospel had moved on to the foreign nation as the Israelites had rejected it. Paul wrote that once the gospel spread to all nations, the Israelites would envy this and eventually return. This was all part of God's amazing plan. Thus, Paul warned the foreign nations not to boast of their salvation. Salvation is the work of God, and humans are expected to be humble at all times regarding this matter. God's mercy and salvation is applicable to everyone. Ultimately, Paul spoke of Israel's eventual restoration. Day 338, Romans 12 to 14, Living Sacrifice and Spiritual Worship. Christians who have received new life should live in the light and give themselves to God as holy living sacrifices to please God. First point. Paul taught about the Christian way of worship and service through the story of the offering in the kingdom of priests. Paul taught that offering oneself as a holy offering to God was a spiritual worship that God wanted. Paul furthermore advised them to live for God's will and joy. Paul, who was well versed in the laws, knew clearly that the offering to God had strict rules in terms of how it was done and what was offered. Thus, it was important to firstly understand what the preparations for the offering were in order to realize the value of worship that Jesus taught us. Paul, moreover, taught that through Jesus Christ, they were all one body. Therefore, it was their task to carry out each of their roles. Second point. Paul taught them to heap burning coals on their enemies' head. Paul taught the Roman church that revenge was God's territory and that Christians were to defeat evil with good. Paul taught them not to repay evil with evil, but with good. By doing so, the enemy will change their heart and have regret and shame later on. Paul here referred to the words in Ecclesiastes. Third point, Paul taught that God managed the world by using empires, such as Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Hellas, and Rome. Paul taught the Roman church about how God managed the world. Paul moreover taught them not to fear the world, but to carry out good deeds. Paul added that they were to offer tax to the world, and this was in line with Jesus' teaching. The reason Paul taught them to live well in the world and pay tax was because God ultimately governed the world. Since through history, God governed the whole world using various empires as his tool. First, God used the Assyrian Empire as his tool to strike those Israel. Second, God used Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar to strike down South Judah. Third, God used the Persian Empire and Cyrus in order to implement his policy of 70 years of captivity. Fourth, God sent Jesus down to earth and used the Roman Empire's policy of the cross to fulfill his world management. Fourth point, Paul taught that the completion of the laws was love. Paul taught the Roman church about the attitude they were to have toward their neighbors. Paul stressed that the fulfillment of the laws was love. Paul added for the church members to each prepare for their own end. All they were to focus on was Jesus Christ and living as Christians. 
fifth point. Paul taught that a Christian was to become God's joy and should strive to be received well by their neighbors. Paul taught the Roman church to benefit from peace. First, the church was not to criticize or rebuke one another. Second, they were not to worry one another. Third, they were to understand that the kingdom of God had righteousness and peace. Thus, Paul taught them to find peace and virtue in daily life. Day 339, Romans 15-16, Priesthood of the Gospel Paul was a man of a vision who wanted to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, and also did not forget to care for church members. First point, Abraham's dream of all nations became implemented through Paul's spreading of the gospel to foreigners. God's vision from the very start was all nations. This dream began through Abraham. 2,000 years after Abraham, Jesus came and gave the mission of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. Paul, who became an apostle for all nations, realized and implemented this. Paul stressed that in order to save all nations, it was important for them to become brothers in Christ. Second point, Jesus' vision to teach all nations became a reality through Paul becoming an apostle for all nations. Jesus, after resurrecting, taught his disciples once again. Paul, to the Roman church, introduced himself as an apostle to the foreign nation. Paul explained that he was an apostle for all nations and that God had called him for all nations. Paul, who had been called by God, indeed had a vision. Paul sincerely wished for all nations to call Jesus Christ and for them to come before God and worship Him. Paul declared that he spent his time spreading the gospel to places that had not yet heard. What Paul wanted to do was to go further to the ends of the earth and spread the gospel to all nations and for the Roman church to provide as a solid base camp for this mission. Third point, Jesus' will to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth led to Paul's dream to go to Spain. Paul now revealed the exact reason as to why he was writing them this letter. Paul told them that he had plans to go to Spain, which at the time was considered the ends of the earth and for this, he planned to visit the Roman church in order to make this a reality. Paul explained that he had wanted to visit them much earlier on, but that this was not easy. Paul then explained the reason why he had to first go to Jerusalem before visiting them. The reason he had to go to Jerusalem was because he had to serve the Jerusalem church. He wished to deliver the financial aid provided by the churches in Macedonia and the Corinthians church, and he furthermore wished to tell them of his missionary journey thus far. Paul asked the Roman church members to pray for him during all of this. First, Paul asked them to pray for safety and protection of his team. Second, he asked them to pray that he and his team served the Jerusalem church acceptingly. Third, he asked them to pray that they would meet soon. Fourth point, Paul, who became a loner in Damascus, was introduced as the leader of his own ministry team in front of the Roman church. In the past, Paul was a loner in Damascus. The moment he met Jesus in Damascus, he became torn from the Sanhedrin assembly, and much later, he became one with Jesus' disciples. After some time, Paul had made many brothers and sisters in Christ through his missionary journeys, and now had a vision to go to Spain. He wanted the Roman church to become his brothers and sisters in Christ, and thus Lord Romans. In doing so, he introduced his ministry team as their leader. 
Fifth point, Paul testified that Jesus' gospel, which completed the laws and the prophets, became his own gospel. Paul mentioned the types of people that the Roman church members were to disassociate themselves from. Paul feared that internal conflict and problems may occur, like it did in the Corinthian church. Paul blessed the Roman church and gave them his blessings. Paul proclaimed Jesus Christ, who came to fulfill the laws and the prophets. He also testified that Jesus' gospel was his own gospel. Day 340, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 to chapter 23. Paul's fifth Sanhedrin assembly trial. Although Paul's fellow workers dissuaded Paul from going to Jerusalem, he boldly moved toward Jerusalem for the greater will of God. First point. On his way to Jerusalem, Paul in Miletus sent for the elders in Ephesus in order to say farewell. Paul's journey to Jerusalem began in AD 57 in Ephesus, where he had previously spent three years during his third missionary journey. However, Paul's plans to go to Rome were disrupted by the Jews, which meant that Paul had to take the long route to avoid them. Paul's journey to Jerusalem was said as follows. Ephesus, Corinth, where he wrote Romans, Philippi, Troas, Assos, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Miletus, Kos, Rhodes, Patara, Tyre, Ptolemais, Caesarea, and Jerusalem. Although Paul had plans to go to Syria from Corinth by sea due to the assassins who so desperately wished to kill Paul, Paul had to travel by land by passing through Corinth to Philippi and then to Troas. When Paul and his team arrived in Troas, despite never having taught the gospel there, they found that there were many believers of Jesus. Although Paul had to leave Troas the next day, he spent the night there and kept communion with them whilst spreading the gospel further. Paul personally taught the gospel all night until the morning. However, it was here that the Eutychus incident occurred. After this, Paul left Troas and then passed through Assos, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, and then arrived in Miletus. Although Paul wanted to visit Ephesus, which was not too far from where he was, he decided to send a person there instead, as he wished to go to Jerusalem by Pentecost. Here Paul gave the final summon to them. He furthermore wished for them to live in the truth of the gospel. Paul moreover blessed the elders and asked them to live by serving and looking after the weak in the church. When it was time for Paul to leave, the church members all embraced Paul and cried especially as they knew they could not meet Paul again, despite knowing that there were people that wanted to carry him on his journey, Paul still decided to leave, and the people also knew this, but had to see Paul leave. Second point, Paul met Philip in Caesarea, whom he almost killed 20 years ago, and stayed at his house. After parting with the elders of Ephesus, Paul finally reached Caesarea. Here, Paul went to the house of Philip and stayed there for a while. Philip was one of the workers who were chosen alongside Stephen and when persecution broke out against the Christians, Philip went to Samaria to spread the gospel. After that, Philip came to Caesarea where he settled. Twenty years ago, Paul and Philip could not imagine being friends. Twenty years later, the gospel brought them together, and Paul now sat as Philip's guest. The two came to realize that this was all a part of God's plan. During the time Paul was staying in Philip's house, Agabus came and made a prediction. Agabus worked in Jerusalem for a long time as a prophet, 
and had predicted the Great Famine a while ago. Despite Agavos' prediction, Paul had no intentions of changing his route. Paul knew full well that if he left for Jerusalem, he had a high chance of being killed, and ultimately, this would mean that he would not be able to go to Rome. Nevertheless, Paul still wished to go to Jerusalem, as this was God's mission given to him. What Paul sincerely wished to do was to visit Jerusalem one last time, pass on the funds to them, and then leave for Rome. Third point, after delivering the aid and his missionary report to the Jerusalem church, Paul was arrested by the Jews in the temple. Paul finally came to Jerusalem church and reported back his previous steps. Firstly, Paul reaccounted what had happened in Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, and so on. Secondly, Paul delivered the funds that he had collected from Macedonia and other places in a constant right way, and so enabled the churches to have a good relationship. When the Jerusalem church heard of Paul's report, they were grateful, but they were also worried for Paul's safety. This was because at the time, there were so many Jews converted to Christians who were also strictly law-based. As Paul spread and taught about the gospel of Jesus Christ, news had spread that Paul was against the law. In order to solve this, the Jerusalem church came up with an idea to convince the Jews. Paul respected and agreed with this decision and decided to go forth with it. However, it so happened that some Jews who came to Jerusalem to keep Pentecost spotted Paul there. They saw Paul carrying out a ceremony with four diaspora Jews, and this led to a misunderstanding. It appeared as though Paul was blaspheming the temple. Consequently, a riot broke out, and the Jews dragged Paul out. The Jews then tried to kill Paul outside the temple. Thankfully, a Roman centurion was there, and Paul was able to save his life. The centurion asked why the Jews were trying to kill Paul. Here, Paul spoke to the centurion in Greek, which startled him. Fourth point, the command of the Roman Empire opened up the fifth Sanhedrin assembly for Paul, who was a Roman citizen. Paul asked for an opportunity to defend himself in front of his people. In order to persuade the Jews, he spoke Hebrew. Paul revealed that he received Jewish education growing up. He clearly stated that he was a man of God. He declared that in the past he was similar to them now. Although Paul honestly tried to persuade them, the Jews still tried to kill Paul. When the commander found that an even bigger riot was about to happen, he took Paul to be slashed. At that moment, Paul revealed that he was a Roman citizen. When the commander heard this, he feared enormously. According to Roman law, if a Roman citizen had been slashed or tied up without proper legal procedures, then this put the commander's job at stake. Therefore, the commander opened up the fifth Sanhedrin assembly for Roman citizen Paul. Thus, 20 years after Stephen's matter, the fifth Sanhedrin assembly was launched. Luke in Acts carefully recorded its content. During his trial, Paul made a big statement, which ultimately split the Pharisees and Sadducees. This opened up a fight, meaning that they did not have time to fight with Paul. Because of this, the command had to take Paul to a place of safety. Fifth point. After the fifth Sanhedrin assembly, the commander put together 470 Roman soldiers in order to take Paul to Caesarea safely. When the massive riot broke out during the fifth Sanhedrin assembly, the trial came to an unfinished close. The Jews who wished to kill Paul woke up the next morning and once again decided to kill Paul. Paul was informed of their plans. Therefore, Paul was ultimately moved to Caesarea by the commander, 
and was handed over to the governor Felix. Day 341, Acts 24 to 26. Paul's request for the emperor's trial. Paul, who was transported to Caesarea after avoiding the threat of the Jews, stayed there for two years and was made to go to Rome because he asked for the Roman Empire's trial. First point, as the Sanhedrin assembly used the trial of Pontius Pilate in the past to kill Jesus, this time they planned to use the trial of Governor Felix to kill Paul. A captain of a thousand who was patrolling Jerusalem at the time dedicated 470 Roman soldiers to secretly protect and take Paul to Caesarea at night. The next morning, the Sanhedrin assembly found out about this and went into frenzy. There was a particular group among the Jews who planned to kill Paul, using the sixth Sanhedrin assembly trial, and so when they found out that Paul secretly escaped, they fumed with anger. However, after five days, they got their act together and made an official appeal and request to arrest Paul. In the past, they had used the trial of Pontius Pilate to kill Jesus on the cross, and this time they planned to use the trial of Governor Felix to kill Paul. Felix accepted their request and officially permitted Paul's trial. The trial was to be held by Felix, and the script was to be written by the Sanhedrin assembly, with Paul as a defendant without a legal representative. During trial, Paul declared his innocence. Firstly, Paul spoke against the allegations of offending the Jews. Paul stated that he had only been in Jerusalem for 12 days and therefore did not have the time to cause offense. Paul added that there was no witness for this allegation. Secondly, he spoke against the terms that he was the head of a heresy. Paul explained that he was not a heretic and that he believed in the Old Testament, as well as the resurrection. Thirdly, Paul spoke against the allegation that he blasphemed the Jerusalem temple. Paul explained that he collected the funds for Jerusalem and that if there was anything wrong with this, the people affected should have made charges against him straight away. Second point, in order to learn about Jesus, to receive money, and to gain popularity among the Jews, Governor Felix made Paul stay in Caesarea for two years under his supervision. Felix, who heard Paul's statement, could not find a fault in him. However, as this was a political matter, he decided to postpone this trial to when the captain of a thousand came to Jerusalem. What Felix should have done was to declare Paul's innocence and stopped everything then and there. However, Felix was stuck between Paul and the Jews and wished to please both sides. Felix had three reasons for locking up Paul in Caesarea for two years. The first was because his wife was a Jew and therefore had heard about Jesus. He and his wife both wished to learn more about Jesus from Paul. The second was because he wished to gain support from the Jews. He did not want the Jews to resent him, and therefore he did the minimum act of locking up Paul. The third was because he knew that Paul had collected the funds and therefore wished to receive money from him. However, Festus came to take his place as governor. Therefore, as his last gift to the Jews, Felix put Paul back in prison and then left Caesarea to return to Rome. Third point, Paul did not agree to the Sixth Sanhedrin Assembly trial as Governor Festus suggested, but rather requested for the trial by the Roman Emperor as a Roman citizen. Festus, who took over Felix's price, decided to look around Jerusalem for three days after his arrival. The Sanhedrin assembly used this as an opportunity 
to once again attempt to kill Paul via a Sanhedrin assembly trial. The Sanhedrin assembly requested to Festus to open the sixth trial against Paul. What they really had in mind was to assassinate Paul on his way to Jerusalem. To their disappointment, Festus did not permit their request, but rather told them that he would open a governor trial in Caesarea. Thus, Paul once again stood at a courtroom two years since Felix's trial. Once again, the Sanhedrin assembly was unable to find any valid reasons to kill Paul. Governor Festus feared that his relationship with the Sanhedrin assembly may become awkward, and so Festus asked Paul whether he would be willing to receive the sixth Sanhedrin assembly trial. To this, Paul requested the trial from the Roman emperor. Paul knew that Festus had to listen to a Roman citizen more so than the Jews. Thus, Roman citizen Paul left for the emperor's trial from Caesarea to Rome. Fourth point, in order to arrange Paul's case, Festus consulted King Agrippa. One day, Governor Festus met with King Agrippa, who came to visit, and they had a talk about various matters. One of the issues raised by Festus was what happened in Jerusalem and Caesarea, and he asked him for advice on this matter. The reason he asked for advice was because he was unable to find a fault in Paul. Festus had to write an official appeal in order for Paul to receive a trial, but he was unable to find a suitable crime. He also knew that Paul was not safe with the Sanhedrin assembly. When Agrippa heard all this, he wanted to meet Paul in person, and so this was arranged. Fifth point, during the meeting with King Agrippa, Paul spread Jesus' gospel. Paul used the last opportunity he was given to defend himself. First, Paul explained his past and how he was a Jew. Second, Paul explained how he became a Christian via his Damascus moment. Third, Paul declared that he was called as an apostle for 40 nations by God. Fourth, Paul came to his conclusion that the reason for his persecution was due to the fact that he was trying to spread the gospel to foreign nations. Using this opportunity, Paul also proclaimed Jesus and the cross. Hearing this, Festus claimed Paul's lunacy due to his learning. To Festus, Paul's spiritual experience and faith made him look crazy. Even after hearing that he was crazy, Paul continued to speak to Agrippa. At last, the matter came to a cross. Although all who were there agreed that Paul was innocent, Paul was unable to leave prison, and he still had to await his trial from the Roman emperor. However, despite this, Paul was still glad that he could go to Rome. As such, Paul used every opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus. Day 342, Acts 27 to 28. Paul arrives in Rome as a prisoner. Whilst in Rome, Paul resided in his rented house for two years and preached the gospel, and this became an important channel of spreading the gospel to the whole world. First point Paul used his Roman citizenship three times. Paul used his Roman citizenship in order to escape from the threats of the Sanhedrin assembly and went to Rome from Caesarea. If Paul had not been a Roman citizen, most likely he would have been stoned like Stephen. As such, Paul used his Roman citizenship at the most crucial moments. Paul used his citizenship three times. The first was after he was slashed in Philippi and then locked in prison, he used it to leave prison. The second was before he was almost slashed by the commander of a thousand in Jerusalem. The third was leading up to the sixth Sanhedrin assembly trial, and he instead requested the trial 
from the Roman emperor as a Roman citizen. Second point, look who rode the ship from Caesarea to Rome with Paul the prisoner recorded the greatest storm they encountered thoroughly. As a prisoner, Paul took a ship from Caesarea to Rome. Paul was joined by Luke and Aristarchus, and Luke thoroughly recorded this journey. The person in charge of them was the centurion Julius, and the ship arrived in Crete before Rome. When they arrived in Crete, Paul advised to spend some time there due to the growing waves. However, the centurion listened to the captain of the ship, and so set out for Rome straight away. However, as predicted by Paul, the ship quickly faced a vast storm. Third point, the Roman centurion Cornelius listened to the words of Peter, and the Roman centurion Julius listened to the words of Paul. Amidst the frightening storm, Paul gathered the people who were on the ship, including Julius the centurion, and encouraged them with God's words. Also, thanks to Paul's help, they were able to stop the crew from escaping. This time, the centurion listened to Paul. During the harsh storm, Paul fed the people there and energized them. This was like a holy communion, whereby Paul fed 276 people on the ship and calmed them down. When they vaguely saw some land, the Roman soldiers suggested to Julius to kill the prisoners as they feared that the prisoners might swim and flee. However, Julius did not listen to his men but rather focused on saving Paul and ordered for those who were able to swim to get off the ship and swim to shore. Paul's team was able to get off the ship and they landed in Malta. The people on that ship ended up staying for three months. And there Paul taught the gospel and many came to believe in Jesus. Fourth point, many people in Rome read Paul's letter Romans. And so when Paul arrived in Rome, he was welcomed by the people. Paul finally arrived in Rome and was able to meet the members of the Roman church. Many members of the Roman church waited for Paul after reading his letter to them. They traveled some distance in order to greet Paul. And when Paul saw this, he was greatly encouraged. From then on, Paul received the protection of a Roman soldier whilst waiting for the Roman emperor's trial. Fifth point, the 30 years of Acts records the spreading of the gospel and numerous trials. Although Paul ended up going to Rome as a prisoner due to a series of trials from the Sanhedrin assembly, Felix and Festus, he still had hopes to prove his innocence before the Roman emperor and then to build a missionary center in order to travel to Spain. Thus, Acts was recorded by Luke in order to record how the apostles, including Paul, worked ferociously for 30 years in order to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. As you read to record, all five Sanhedrin assembly trials resulted from the Jerusalem Council and also the trial under the Roman governor. Although Paul had to spend his time as a prisoner, he was able to meet people like Onesimus, as well as write letters such as Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, and to continue his mission of spreading the gospel. Day 343, Ephesians 1-3, Church, the Body of Christ the hand of God that protected humans since creation continues to protect the Christians and the churches through His grace. First point, as the 66 books in the Bible are one book, the four prison letters of Paul are also one book. As Paul awaited his trial from the Roman Emperor, he wrote letters to the people he could not meet. First, Ephesians and Colossians theoretically unravel what the gospel is about. Second, Philippians and Philemon practically unravel how to act through the gospel. Third, 
Although Ephesians and Colossians had two separate books, they both collectively state what a church is. Furthermore, Paul looks into who Jesus is with a focus on the church and Christianity. Fourth, although Ephesians and Philippians are also two different books, they both point towards how Christians are the body of Christ and how Christians should love and serve within the church. And fifth, Colossians and Philemon both teach how we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Second point, Paul praised the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who grants salvation. Ephesians was written to be read by the Ephesians church, as well as the churches around the region. The person to deliver this letter was Tychicus. Paul loved Tychicus as his brother in Christ, and so gave him the role of delivering his current situation to the churches around the Ephesus area. Tychicus also delivered Paul's other letters, such as Colossians and Philemon. He was also one of the people to deliver aid to the Jerusalem church. The Ephesians church received Paul's letter through Tychicus and praised the Lord for his salvation. Paul wrote that God had a plan for us before creating the universe, and that the Father sent us Jesus Christ in order to save us and grant us eternal life. Paul furthermore thought that God's grace and glory was what made us rejoice. Paul also praised the Holy Spirit for protecting them all. Third point, Paul justified the church as the body of Christ. Paul wrote that all the blessings in the Ephesians church were God's grace and the workings of Jesus Christ. Here, Paul reported to the words in the Old Testament in order to testify Jesus. The contents of Paul's letter here started the words on Christology. This was ultimately a message that Christ was the head who governed the humans who were the body of Christ. As such, Paul defined in Ephesians chapter 1 what a church was. Paul justified a church to be made up of Christians who are the body of Christ, and they, through Jesus, were saved and granted eternal life. Furthermore, God, who forgave our sins, also revealed his secret to us. This secret was that church enables humans to understand God's creation and God's workings. Through Jesus' cross, we became God's new creation and ultimately Christians. A church, therefore, is incomparable to any other. It is a gathering of people to celebrate Jesus and to act as the body of Christ. Fourth point, Paul taught that Jesus' cross enabled our bodies to become the temple of Christ. The history of the church is as follows. It started with two stone tablets, the ark, the tabernacle, the temple, birth of Jesus, the offering of God's young lamb on the cross, resurrection and ascension. Sitting on the right hand of God in heaven, sending of the Holy Spirit, Christ dwells in us, and then your body is the temple of Christ. The greatest event for humankind was no doubt the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ completed the laws and brought peace and made all humans equal before God. Thus, anyone could come before God through their faith in Jesus Christ. Ultimately, our bodies became the temple of Christ. Therefore, Christians are what make up a church. Fifth point, Paul taught that God's plan of blessing all nations existed prior to Abraham and was fulfilled through Jesus. Paul declared that God's calling to him to become an apostle for 40 nations was God's great grace to him. Paul revealed that God called him as an apostle for all nations and had plans to save all humans. The gospel became open to everyone and Paul added that 
he was called by God as God's worker to reveal this truth. Paul followed up by praying for the Ephesians church. Paul first prayed that the members of the Ephesians church strengthened their faith through the Holy Spirit. Second, he prayed that their hearts focused on Christ and that their love grew. Third, he prayed for them to realize God's great love for them and to be full of God's love. Day 344 Ephesians 4-6 Sword of the Holy Spirit Bible Paul exhorted the church members to practice humility, meekness, patience, and love in keeping with the calling of God who had called them from before creation. First point, Paul taught the Ephesians church to practice four things in order to build a beautiful community. Paul taught that in order to build a beautiful community within Christ, four actions needed to be taken. The first was for the church members to increase in their consensus. The second was to raise the status of Christians. The third was to become a Christian family. The fourth was to accept the spiritual armor given by God. To look into what it means in terms of increasing in consensus, Paul was telling them to become one in Christ. Paul stressed that only in this way could the church grow together. Paul then explained the reason why the church members were distinguished into groups and positions. The first reason was for those with positions to take care of the church members. The second was for the people with a position to serve. The third was for them to honor the body of Christ. Thus, those with the positions in churches were to know about the Son of God and to work collectively within the church. Second point, Paul wrote that Christians are renewed after learning about the truth that is Jesus Christ. The second thing Paul requested from the Ephesians church members was to raise the status of Jesus and to become renewed. The reason Christians were able to become renewed was because of the truth of Jesus Christ. Paul taught that in order to become renewed in Christ, they had to firstly stop lying and to speak the truth. Secondly, they were not to hold on to grudges and to not allow Satan to come in. Thirdly, they were not to steal and to work hard in order to provide financial aid to those who need it. Fourthly, they were not to speak evil, but rather to speak of God's grace. Third point, Paul taught the Ephesians church members three things they could do to become more like God. Paul taught them that in order to raise the status of Christ, they were to follow in God's example. In order to follow in God's example, Paul taught them to firstly act with love. Secondly, they were to stop living as disobedient sons. Thirdly, they were to become children of light. Paul moreover taught them how to live wisely. Firstly, they were to treasure their time. Secondly, they were to live according to God's will. Thirdly, they were to live in the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, they were to be grateful in their lives and to obey. Fourth point, Paul taught the Ephesians church about the family life for Christians. The third thing Paul taught the church was to build a Christian family. In order to do so, there was something for the husband and wife. Paul firstly explained the role of wives in raising a Christian family. Secondly, the role of husbands in a Christian family was given. Thirdly, God gave both the husband and wife roles in order to raise a Christian family. As Christ and the church is inseparable, a married couple is also inseparable. And here, Paul reported to the passage in Genesis. Thus, in order to raise a Christian family, it was important for the parents to implement their roles wisely. The roles of children and parents 
can be found in Ephesians. These words were also for society and the whole. There were also words for the servants and for the master. Paul did not differentiate or discriminate between the master and the servant, but rather proposed how they were to live as everyone is equal in God's eyes. Fifth point, Paul taught how to fight the spiritual fight through God's words. The last teaching of Paul to the Ephesians was to bear the armor of God and to become renewed. Paul taught them that during spiritual fights, they were to pray for the Holy Spirit to be with them. Paul also asked for their prayers, and he also was fighting a spiritual fight. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, it was impossible for Paul to continue his missionary. Day 345 Philippians 1-4 Jesus is enough. The joy of Paul, who learned how to be self-sufficient in any situation, was the joy which was bound together with the suffering for the gospel. First point. Paul, who was locked in a Roman prison, wrote to the Philippians church to always rejoice in Christ. Philippians was a letter sent by Paul and Timothy to the church members in Philippi, the overseers and the deacons. The person to deliver this letter was Epaphroditus. The letter to the Philippians also started with Paul's greeting as in all of his letters. Next, Paul wrote his thanks towards them. The reason for thanking them was because the Philippians church had provided support to Paul for a long time. Thus, Paul told them that he was truly grateful and that he had a great deal of love for them. Paul firstly wrote that he was grateful that they had fully embraced the gospel of Jesus. Secondly, he was happy that Epaphroditus had recovered his health. Thirdly, he was grateful for their financial aid. Fourthly, he was grateful that they considered God and their neighbors. Paul wrote that he was waiting for the trial from the Roman emperor and that he was locked up. However, he felt blessed that the gospel was being spread even though he was locked up. Paul explained that his locked up state had produced two types of people. The first were the kind and innocent people who wished to spread the gospel. The second were those who were jealous and spread the gospel. With an unfortunate state of mind, Paul added that in whatever form, he was just happy that the gospel was spreading. Second point, Paul taught the Philippians church members to learn Jesus' meekness and humility and to serve others. Paul heard of some of the problems within the Philippians church from Epaphroditus, who was their minister. Regarding these matters, Paul gave them advice. At the time, the Philippians church tried to rise higher than others. To them, Paul taught them to be humble with the heart of Jesus. Jesus was the physical form of God, but volunteered to serve people, and even went as far as to die to save all humans. Jesus, who is equal to God, served and humbled himself. Thus, Paul taught them to be more like Jesus and to serve others voluntarily. This was a way for Christians to live. Third point, Paul wrote that although he wished to have Epaphroditus beside him, he sent him to the Philippians church. At the time, Paul was in Rome and he waited for the trial from the Roman emperor. He was locked up, but he had Luke and Timothy by his side. And despite needing them both, he decided to send Timothy to Philippi. The reason for sending Timothy was firstly because Paul was worried about Epaphroditus's health and so wanted to console the church. Secondly, no one knew Paul's circumstances better than Timothy. And so Paul wanted Timothy 
to go and report Paul's state to the Philippians church. When Epaphroditus regained his health, he sent Epaphroditus back to Philippi. Paul explained to the church members that Epaphroditus had come to Rome to deliver the funds that Paul had requested, but then became sick to the point of death. Because of this, Paul and the Philippians church worried greatly. That is why Paul urgently sent Timothy to them. Thankfully, God healed Epaphroditus and this pleased Paul greatly. Fourth point, Paul taught the Philippians church that the knowledge of Jesus Christ was more than enough in our lives. Paul taught the Philippians church what the true meaning of circumcision was as well as God's will. First, Paul warned them against the arrogant Jews who enforced the laws and circumcision. Second, Paul taught them what the true meaning of circumcision was. Third, Paul emphasized that the knowledge of Jesus was more than enough. The reason Paul was able to declare this was because he knew more about the laws than anyone else. Fifth point, Paul's gladness reached the Philippians and made them rejoice. Paul advised to the Philippians church to firstly implement the heart of God. Second, he told them always to rejoice. Third, he told them to tolerate. Fourth, he told them to pray to God. Fifth, he told them to serve others. Sixth, he told them to reflect on what they have learned and to implement them. As such, Paul lovingly advised the Philippians church and once again expressed how grateful he was. Day 346, Colossians 1-4 God's secret, Jesus Jesus Christ, who is the very body of truth, is God's secret in which all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. First point, Paul's letters Colossians and Philemon are like two sides of one coin. Paul wrote two letters, Colossians and Philemon, to Archippus and Philemon in the Colossians church and had Tychicus deliver it. These two letters can be seen as two sides of one coin. Paul's letter to the Colossians deals with who Jesus is and how we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. The letter to Philemon ultimately taught Philemon to go beyond the slave-master relationship built by the Roman Empire and go toward his brotherhood in the kingdom of God. Paul expressed his thanks to the Colossians church for firstly deepening their faith in Jesus, secondly for their love, and thirdly for their hope in heaven. Paul also added his thanks and love towards Epaphras, who was the minister of the Colossians church. Paul furthermore prayed for them. Second point, Paul testified that all things gracious were in the secret of Jesus Christ. Paul taught the Colossians church about who Jesus is. Ultimately, Paul taught that Jesus Christ is the foundation to everything. Through Colossians, Paul introduced Jesus as the most outstanding being, the head of the church and God's secret. Paul summarized Jesus' status, prestige, and position. First, Jesus' status is the Savior. Second, Jesus' authority is the Creator. Third, Jesus' position is the head of the church. Fourth, Jesus' role was to take on the cross and to save all people. Paul moreover stated that he had been appointed as the apostle for 14 nations in order to reveal this truth. Thus, Paul's vision was to reveal Jesus to all nations. Third point, Paul wrote to the Colossians church to always realize the truth of Jesus Christ and to not waver whatever comes their way. Although Paul was unable to see the members of the Colossians church face to face, he nevertheless revealed his love and interest in them. He furthermore advised them to never waver in their faith. 
Paul stressed that God put everything in Jesus Christ. Thus, the knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ had the ability to defeat all the false teachings. Fourth point, to the Nineveh Colossians church, Paul advised them to seek from heaven. To the Nineveh Colossians church, Paul taught them to always seek from heaven. He taught them to let go of old habits, and especially adultery, negativity, greed, idol worship, lying, and so on. Instead, he taught them to be merciful, humble, meek, and persevering, and to forgive one another and to always praise God. In addition, Paul exalted them about Christian families within the church. Fifth point, Paul especially introduced Tychicus and Onesimus to the Colossians church. Paul introduced Tychicus and Onesimus to the Colossians church. The reason Paul sent Tychicus to the Colossians church was because Paul was in prison, but still wished to console the church members, and also for Philemon and Onesimus to start a new relationship in God. Paul then told the church to pass on his greetings to his fellow workers. As such, Paul was always working with colleagues in Christ. We remember that in Romans chapter 16, Paul greeted all his fellow workers in Rome, despite never having visited the place. This applied also for Colossians church. Despite how Paul was locked up in a Roman prison at the time, he still greeted and cared deeply for his workers. Day 347 by Lemon Beyond the Empires and to the Kingdom of God Paul's letter that suggested master and servant to become brothers in Christ in the midst of the Roman Empire was truly a letter of miracle. First point, the letter by Lemon was a miracle story made by Paul, Tychicus, Onesimus, and Philemon. Paul's letter to Philemon contained Paul's honest attempt to restore brotherhood in the kingdom of God in the middle of the Roman Empire. This was Paul's declaration for the kingdom of God. Second point, Philemon was written by Paul who believed in Jesus to Philemon who believed in Jesus asking to accept Onesimus, who also believed in Jesus as his brother in Christ. Paul reported to Philemon as his brother in Christ. Paul stressed that as he and Philemon believed in Jesus, this made them brothers in Christ. Thus, Paul asked Philemon to furthermore accept Onesimus as his brother in Christ. Third point. Paul knew what happened to learn away slaves under the Roman Empire. During the Roman Empire, slaves were the possessions and property of their master. Thus, if a master decided to kill his slave, this was not a problem. It was amidst such background that Paul wrote my lemon. Fourth point, Paul, who was a man of action, advised the five lemon to overcome the rules of an empire and act as a brother in God's kingdom. Killing a slave went against the policies of brotherhood in the kingdom of God. Paul, who was a man of action, chose not the empire but the kingdom of God and prioritized the brotherhood and told Philemon to do the same. Fifth point. Paul told Philemon to read both Colossians and Philemon together in one sitting. Paul told Philemon to go with the kingdom of God rather than the policies of the Roman Empire. He told him not to kill his runaway slave but to embrace him as his brother in Christ. Thus, both Colossians and Philemon stressed the kingdom of God above empires. Ultimately, Philemon accepted Onesimus as his brother in Christ. Day 348 1 Timothy 1-6 The Attitude of God's Workers Paul, who devoted himself to the church for all his life, 
left the painstaking advice for Timothy, his spiritual son, who was to lead the church after him. First point, in the entire New Testament, the divide between the first and second generation of the gospel era is made by the instant of the great fire of Rome. Following on from the four letters Paul wrote in prison, we come to the letters he sent to his sons in faith. Paul, as the first generation of the gospel era, wrote to the second generation. Timothy and Titus. The letters are 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. The first and second generation of the gospel era is divided by the instant of the great fire of Rome that occurred in AD 64. The first generation gospel era began from the point of Jesus' cross through to the great fire of Rome in AD 64. And these were the people who were with Jesus during his public life and witnessed Jesus' resurrection. Furthermore, these were the people who spent 30 years fighting against the Sanhedrin assembly. The reason why the first and second generation was separated is because in AD 64, Emperor Nero carried around 200 first generation leaders following the Great Fire of Rome. The second generation were the Christian leaders who worked from AD 64 onwards. Through to the time, St. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. They were the ones who received the gospel from the first generation, such as Timothy, Titus, Mark, Apollos, Epaphroditus, Tychicus, Onesimus, and so on. All of these people fought against the persecution of the Roman Empire. Timothy was there when Paul tried to figure out how to make arrangements for the second generation. Timothy was Paul's son in faith and an invaluable co-worker to Paul. Second point, Paul taught Timothy how to become a minister. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, he taught him about what a church is by outlining two points. The first of the two was that the church was made up of a person or people that believed in Jesus Christ. They made the body of Christ. The second was the organization of the church. This concerned the setting up the elders and workers of the church. Paul taught Timothy about the role of the minister. Furthermore, Paul advised Timothy to be careful of fool's teachings. Paul stressed that the core of fool's teachings came from the teachers of the law. Paul went on to teach Timothy that the laws were there to help us realize our sins. As such, Paul taught his loving son in faith to be cautious of false teachers. Paul then told Timothy about his testimony, followed by teachings of the necessary attitude of ministers. First, Paul confessed to Timothy of his past days and testified that he was forgiven by Jesus and thus Timothy should be like Paul in accepting Jesus' mercy. Second, Paul taught Timothy to fight the righteous fight and to live by faith and good deed. Third, Paul taught to be cautious of false and evil teachers. We can see that Paul did his best to prepare Timothy for what was to come. Paul knew the difficulties of Timothy's job more than anyone else. Thus, Paul did his best to thoroughly teach, advise, and warn Timothy. Third point, Paul taught Timothy about the importance of praying for others. Paul continued to teach Timothy about the importance of praying for others. The reason we want to pray for others was because Jesus prayed for us. Paul told Timothy to pray for the community especially for those in higher positions with greater responsibilities. And for the church members, they were also to pray for their community and for the church and to do their best to establish the best community possible. Each had an obligation to work hard for the kingdom of God. Fourth point, Paul taught that 
the qualifications and determination to fulfill an official position in church was more important than the status itself. Paul continued to teach Timothy how to be a good minister. The next topic concerned the overseers and the deacons in the church. The first concerned the overseers. The second concerned the deacons. Next, Paul revealed the reason and purpose for his first letter to Timothy. Paul wished for Timothy, who was ministering in the Ephesian church, to also learn about the church and to spread the gospel with the incredible secret and power of the gospel. Paul once again stressed to Timothy to be careful of false teachers. Paul wrote that holiness did not come from keeping a pure way of life, but from believing in God and praying to God. Thus, Paul told Timothy to implement these teachings and to dedicate himself to his given position. Fifth point, Paul taught Timothy about the attitude a minister was to have towards the elderly, the widow, the elders, and so on. Paul's teachings to Timothy continued, and the next topic regarded the attitude he was to have within the church. The first was to treat the church members as his family. The second was to give proper recognition to the widows who were in need. But if the widow had children or grandchildren, they were to be cared by their own family, so as to focus care on true widows in need. Thirdly, the elders were to be respected and taken care of financially. Next, Paul wrote about his concerns for Timothy's health. Following on, Paul wrote about a very cautious topic in the church, which concerned those with status and servants. This concerned slavery and missed the police of the Roman Empire. First, servants were not to rebuke their masters if their master was yet a non-believer. Second, servants were to be respectful to their masters as brothers in Christ if their master was a believer. These were the teachings that were to be taught to the church members with slave status at the time. Paul once again stressed to Timothy to be careful of false teachers. Paul then closed his letter by first telling him to fight the righteous fight. Second, he advised Timothy to enable the rich to use their fortune well. Third, he was always to be cautious of false teachers. Day 349, Titus 1-3 Set up a leader. Paul preached for those who accept the faith to be empowered by the grace of God and to be beneficiaries of faith and hope. First point, the representatives for the second generation of the Gospel era were Timothy, Titus, and Luke. Paul wrote about ministry to his two sons in faith, Timothy and Titus. As he did to Timothy, Paul also referred to Titus as his son. Titus was a highly trusted co-worker of Paul's. Where Paul could not go, he sent Titus. When Paul was locked in prison, he wrote to Titus in order to give him instructions. Second point, Paul told Titus to establish elders in all the areas of Crete. To Titus, who was going through a difficult situation in Crete, Paul wrote him a letter in order to encourage him to persevere and to continue spreading the gospel. The reason Paul sent Titus to the church in Crete was firstly because the area was a difficult place to minister. Secondly, Paul wanted Titus to establish elders in Crete. Thirdly, Titus was sent in order to protect Crete against false teachers. Paul asked Titus to stabilize the Crete church that was wavering due to false teachers. Third point, Paul advised Titus who was a young leader of the second generation, to minister wisely with the authority given to him by God. Paul advised Titus to always minister and lead by example. Paul told him to proclaim the gospel with the authority given to him by God. 
Paul advised both Titus and Timothy to lead by example in their daily service to God and the church and to minister with their God-given authority. Fourth point, Paul taught Titus about the right attitude towards those who believed in false gods. And Paul advised Timothy to be cautious of false teachers. He also advised Titus to always be cautious. The first thing Paul emphasized was the attitude the minister was to have towards those with the power. Paul was concerned due to the Roman Empire's policy at the time, which opened the possibility to conflict. The second thing Paul wrote regarded the attitude a minister was to have towards those without faith. Paul stressed that Paul and Titus themselves too did not have faith in the past, and that through God's grace they were renewed. The third thing was the attitude to have towards those who were into false teachings. Titus was not to speak for them, and he was not to argue with them. He was to try to convince them one or two times, and if they did not listen, he was to avoid them. Fifth point, Paul taught Titus to cooperate with his co-workers carefully and thoroughly. Paul now concluded his letter to Titus and wrote his final words. They were to cooperate with their co-workers carefully. In order to help Titus in Crete, Paul had sent Janus and Apollos. Paul wrote that he wanted to meet Titus in Nicopolis in order to discuss the future plans for spreading the gospel. Also, he planned to send either Artemis or Tychicus so that the Crete church would not be ministerless. Paul also asked him to send Janus and Apollos back to Rome, where he was as soon as possible during that time. Paul moreover asked Titus to supply his co-workers with what they needed. Day 350, 2 Timothy 1-4 The Second Generation Christians Paul asked Timothy to preach the gospel boldly in season or out of season and carry out the beautiful work of Jesus Christ. First point, addressed to the second generation leaders of the gospel era, Paul wrote to Timothy to succeed his faith immediately following the great fire of Rome, which spread in AD 64. During the time, Paul was locked in a Roman prison. Paul wrote four letters and then moreover wrote letters to Timothy and Titus in order to teach them about ministry. For a short while afterwards, Paul was temporarily set free and he used this time to spread the gospel, but all of a sudden, he was taken back into prison upon the emperor's orders. The reason was because of the great fire of Rome in AD 64. Before Paul was martyred, he wrote to Timothy his final will. This letter to Timothy was not only his final letter to Timothy, but it was also a general letter of will to the second generation leaders. The final letter Paul wrote to Timothy is broadly divided into three parts. The first part told Timothy to receive suffering with the gospel. The second part told Timothy to spread the gospel whether it was a good time or a bad time. The third was asking Timothy to quickly come to Rome. Prior to this, Paul had sincerely wanted to take the second generation leaders with him after the trial from the Roman Emperor and to go to Spain, which was considered the ends of the earth, in order to spread the gospel there. However, with the change in circumstances, Paul had to pass his mission unto the second generation. Also now, the second generation leaders had to fight against the Roman Empire's persecution, which was incomparable to the opposition of the Jews. Thus, Paul requested them to be strong in their life of ministry and to implement their roles with full force. Second point, 
to Timothy, who represented the second generation leaders, Paul told him to accept persecution alongside the gospel. Paul wrote his final letter to Timothy, and this letter contained his will. This letter was also written from the perspective of a father to his son in faith. To Timothy, Paul told him to accept persecution alongside the gospel. Paul passed on his first generation faith to Timothy and told him to preach up the gospel of the kingdom of God. Third point, first generation Paul requested to second generation Timothy to nurture third generation Christians. Paul, who was a first generation Christian, requested to Timothy, who was a second generation Christian, to nurture third generation Christians. Next, Paul taught Timothy to become a loyal worker for God. In order to do so, he was firstly to know what the truth was and to distinguish between what was right and wrong. Secondly, he was to become a suitable leader to his role. Thirdly, he was to live with a pure and holy heart, will, faith, love, and peace. Fourthly, he was to get rid of debate and to teach with humility. Fourth point, Paul taught Timothy that all standards were decided by the whole Bible. Paul now told Timothy about what was to come and cautioned him. Paul once again warned Timothy to be careful of false teachers. Paul then wrote that persecution was to come. Thus, Paul told Timothy to make the Bible alone his standard, and that the benchmark was all the Bible. Fifth point, Paul wished to meet Timothy and Mark for the final time. Paul wrote his final words to Timothy. The first was to make sure to spread the gospel, regardless of whether it was or was not a good time. The second was to always continue with his given role, no matter how severe the persecution became. The third was to always have a hope for eternal glory. The fourth was Paul's desire to see Timothy and Mark for the final time. Paul glorified God and then wrote his final blessings. Day 351, Hebrews 1-4 Jesus, the ultimate high priest. Jesus, who carried out the great ministry of redeeming all humankind at the soul of God, can help those who are facing persecution. First point, the nine epistles, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, Jude, 1, 2 and 3 John, and Revelation were all written in the middle of the persecution of the Roman Empire. The atmosphere of the nine epistles was that of implementing the kingdom of God through the persecution of the Roman Empire. From AD 30 to AD 64, Christians were persecuted predominantly by the Jews. However, in AD 64, the Great Fire of Rome became a huge turning point where the Roman Empire started to blame Christians for starting the fire. At this time, Paul wrote to Timothy whilst in prison. With the matter of first-generation Christians and the growing persecution, many Christians who were formerly Jews started to waver and consider returning to the Jewish religion. To make matters worse, false teachers came into the church community and tried to confuse Christians even further. Because of this, first-generation leaders started to write letters to the Christians. The nine epistles, therefore, were written in order to prevent Christians from wavering. These letters were not directed to a certain someone, but were public letters by first-generation readers for the second-generation readers to maintain their faith and to nurture third-generation Christians. Second point, the writer of Hebrews testified that prophets were there 
to deliver God's messages and Jesus came to fulfill the words of the prophet. The writer of Hebrews traced back to the Old Testament in order to come to Jesus Christ and moreover looked closely into the people who read the history through to Jesus in order to state where the root of faith came from. The root came from God's Son, Jesus Christ. The light of Hebrews clearly knew very well about the Old Testament. Above all, the light knew that Jesus had come to fulfill the laws. Thus, the writer aimed to encourage Christians who were being persecuted at the time and to not give up on their faith. The light of Hebrews described Jesus' identity. The first was the Son of God, and here the reference came from Psalm and to Samuel. The second was that Jesus was praised by all the angels. This reference came from Psalms. The third was that Jesus governed all the earth. This reference also came from Psalm. The fourth was that Jesus created the universe. This also referenced the Psalm. The fifth was that Jesus judged the whole world, another reference from Psalm. Third point, the light of Hebrews declared that Jesus came to experience death in order to forgive our sins. The light of Hebrews compared the angels to Jesus and testified that the angels served God, but Jesus was the Son of God. However, Jesus came to the world beneath the angels in order to save all human beings. The writer moreover testified that Jesus made everyone his brothers and came as our Savior. Jesus, the Messiah, came to liberate his people from sin and went as far as to die for us. Fourth point, the light of Hebrews teaches us to deeply reflect on Jesus who came as the high priest. In order to prevent Christians from returning to the Jewish religion, the light of Hebrews compared Moses and Joshua to Jesus. The aim was to help them realize that Jesus was the Son of God. The light stressed that although Moses was the leader of the Israelites, he was still a servant of God. The light then testified that Jesus was God's son and the owner of God's house. Also, Joshua was Israel's leader who led his nation into the land of Canaan, but Jesus came as our Savior to lead us into eternal life. The right went on to testify that Jesus came as the ultimate high priest who came to offer his own body to God for our sins. Believing in Jesus means that we believe in God. The writer stressed that Christians were to reflect on Jesus and to persevere through the current persecution. Fifth point, the light of Hebrews proclaimed that only those who obeyed in God would be able to experience God's Sabbath. The writer of Hebrews stated that those who heard the gospel but still refused to listen, would not be able to enjoy God's Sabbath. This was a warning against the Christians whose faith was wavering due to the persecution by the Roman Empire. The writer of Hebrews wrote that the Exodus generation was unable to enter Canaan because they did not obey God. The writer also added that God had planned the Sabbath since creation. Thus, only those who obeyed God would be able to enjoy God's Sabbath. Day 352, Hebrews 5-10 High Priest Jesus, the New Covenant Jesus completed the Old Covenant, which had the limits of time and space and thereby saved all people of this world by becoming master of the new covenant. First point, the light of Hebrews testified that Jesus came as the high priest following Melchizedek. 
Aaron's descendants had maintained the position of a high priest for 1,500 years in a kingdom of priests. Because of this, all Jews respected the high priests who worked in the temple. There were some who considered Jesus' authority to be lower than the high priests. Regarding this, the right of Hebrews declared that Jesus' authority was incomparable to the high priests. In order to clarify this, the writer outlined the qualifications that were needed to be a high priest. The high priest in a kingdom of priests was among the people and called by God. Jesus was indeed overqualified. Jesus came as a human and was also called by God as a high priest. Thus, Jesus was incomparable to any high priest in the temple. Jesus came as the Son of God in order to suffer. As such, the right of Hebrews stressed that Jesus came with ultimate authority as a high priest. Following this, Melchizedek was described. Firstly, Melchizedek was God's high priest. Second, Melchizedek was a high priest who received Abraham's tithe. Third, Melchizedek resembled God's son closely. Next, the writer continued to state the reason as to why Melchizedek was above the high priestess, selected from the tribe of Levi. First, Melchizedek had received Abraham's tithe and had blessed Abraham, who was the ancestor of the Jews. Second, although the tribe of Levi died, Melchizedek remained as a high priest. Third, Abraham's descendants in the tribe of Levi had also offered tithe to Melchizedek. In other words, Melchizedek had become high priest much prior to the tribe of Levi being given the position. Also, that he blessed Abraham priced Melchizedek above Abraham. He just came as a high priest, not from the descent of Levi, but from Melchizedek. Thus, Jesus came as the ultimate high priest. Second point, the light of Hebrews testified that Jesus came as the high priest and the guarantee of the new covenant. The light of Hebrews testified that Jesus came with the new covenant and as the everlasting high priest. The reason Jesus became high priest was first because he was without evil or sin and was holy. Second, he was higher than the heavens. Third, he gave himself at once on the cross to complete all offerings. Fourth, Jesus is everlasting because he is the Son of God. The writer went on to testify that Jesus came with the new covenant which had been pre-told by Jeremiah. To the people who had broken God's covenant, Jesus came and gave them God's new covenant. God had previously given his covenant on two stone tablets, but due to human disobedience, the tablet was smashed. However, with his mercy, God renewed his covenant with humans. Thus, the old covenant became expired and Jesus came with the everlasting covenant. Third point, the light of Hebrews wrote that although the high priestess in a kingdom of priests made animal offerings, Jesus the high priest offered himself as a sacrifice. The light of Hebrews compared the high priestess in the Old Testament to the ultimate high priest Jesus. During the Old Testament, the high priests had offered animals as a sacrifice, but this was an incomplete offering for the past 1,500 years. With the new covenant, Jesus had offered his own body as a perfect sacrifice and fulfilled the ultimate sacrifice to forgive human sins. The previous high priests had offered animals, but Jesus offered his own body, and this is what the light of Hebrews testified. Fourth point, the light of Hebrews testified 
that Jesus did not go towards the holy place made by hands, but went to the holy place made in heaven. Previously, there had been the burnt, drying, fellowship, guilt, and sin offerings. The people had to use three methods to make an offering, and this included the sacrificial animal, grain, the price, where God chose to put his name for his dwelling and the help of a priest. Additionally, the high priest had to enter the most holy place once a year with his life and the line on the day of atonement. Despite all these procedures, the offering in the kingdom of priests was not a complete one. However, the offering that Jesus brought with the new covenant was complete, and it was not made by hands, but was made in heaven. In order to make this possible, God had prepared Moses and Ben David and the holy places made by hand. With Jesus, God had made the holy place in heaven and made everything possible at the moment Jesus shouted, It is finished on the cross. Although the Israelites were able to enter the holy place, they were not permitted to enter the most holy place. The most holy place was only for the high priest, and he was only to enter once a year. However, with the new covenant, anyone was permitted to come before God through the name of Jesus Christ. Fifth point. The light of Hebrews declared that Jesus ended the 1,500-year tradition of a kingdom of priests through his cross and then went to heaven to await for the day of judgment. The light of Hebrews compared offerings and Jesus. Offerings cannot get rid of sin, but Jesus forgives our sins. This is the good news gospel. The light of Hebrews testified that offerings in the Old Testament was a shadow of the New Covenant and the cross. Jesus enabled us to come between the holy place and the most holy place, to break down the wall between God and humans, and furthermore, open the way for all Christians to live as the children of God. Through the offering of his own body on the cross, Jesus ended the 1,500-year tradition and then ascended into heaven to wait for the final day of judgment. This is the good news gospel. The books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Day 353, Hebrews 11 to 13. Learn towards Jesus, the finish line. When we imitate the forefathers of faith, look up to Jesus, and endure the temporary suffering, we can produce fruit of righteousness and peace. First point. The light of Hebrews clarified the history of Israel with one word, faith. Hebrews chapter 11 is all about faith. In order to emphasize faith in God, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 stressed the word faith multiple times and claimed that one cannot please God without faith. The writer clarified what faith is by tracing the history of Israel. First, Abel made his offering to God with faith. Second, Enoch pleased God with his faith and walked with God. Third, Noah constructed the ark with faith. Next, the patriarchs also lived by faith in God. Moving on to after prehistory, first, Abraham obeyed God and moved to the promised land, and Sarah obeyed and was able to conceive Isaac. Second, Isaac, Jacob, Isa, and Joseph all continued to obey God. Next, many people pleased God with their faith after Exodus. First, Moses pleased God with his obedience by leading God's people into Canaan. Second, Joshua pleased God by obeying. Next, Gideon, other judges, and Samuel 
also pleased God with their faith. The light of Hebrews unraveled the history of Israel and then declared the importance of entering the kingdom of God through faith. Second point, the light of Hebrews encouraged the readers to look to Jesus and obey. The light of Hebrews encouraged the readers to follow their ancestors in faith and to look to Jesus. The main message was to look to Jesus. This concerned whether they kept their faith or strayed away and the light moreover linked this to the final day and victory. The light of Hebrews encouraged the readers like a father encourages a son and thought that the current persecution would follow with God's good things and to persevere with faith. The light also encouraged the readers not to leave Christ and to live peacefully with Christians in their holiness. The writer warned that if they left Christ, they would not be given a chance to repent. Thus, they were to keep their faith until the very end, no matter what. Third point, the light of Hebrews warned that if they neglected Jesus' gospel, which was beyond Moses' law, they would not be able to avoid God's anger. The light of Hebrews mentioned that the Jews regarded Moses bigger than Jesus. However, the light stressed that Jesus was above Moses, and if they neglected Jesus' gospel, they would not be able to avoid God's anger. When God gave the laws on Mount Sinai, the land shook, but when he gave Jesus' gospel, the heavens also shook. The writer here referenced the words in Haggai. The writer stressed to keep their faith and to not leave Jesus Christ. Fourth point, the writer of Hebrews taught how to serve God willingly and to live as Christians. The light of Hebrews taught how to live as Christians and how to live whilst willingly serving God. First, they were to love their brothers. Second, they were to take on visitors. Third, they were to consider those who were locked or abused. Fourth, they were to live a holy life. Fifth, they were not to love money but to be grateful. Fifth point. The light of Hebrews advised those who were living among persecution to learn from the first generation of the gospel era. The light of Hebrews stressed the people to keep their faith strong by firstly following in the example of the first generation Christians. Second, they were not to be tempted by false teachings. Third, they were to follow in Jesus and to go towards Jesus. Fourth, they were to always praise and sing to God. Fifth, they were to carry out good deeds and to share between their neighbors. Sixth, they were to obey their leaders in church. The writer ended his letter by asking for prayer. Then, the writer blessed them and said the final wishes. Before ending the letter, the writer of Hebrews delivered the news that Timothy had been locked in prison but had been released and afterwards had traveled far for a mission and had returned. The letter ends on a hopeful note that many evangelists were spreading the gospel despite hardship and persecution and told the readers to greet and encourage one another in Christ. Day 354 James 1-5 1 to 5. Actions of those with faith. Pointing out that there was no practice of true love for neighbors in the church, James strongly taught that faith without practice was a dead faith. First point The book of James, written by Jesus' brother, is similar to Proverbs in the Old Testament. The light of James is Jesus' brother James. James was born after Jesus by Mary and Joseph. James had actually not accepted Jesus as the Son of God prior to when Jesus came to him after resurrection. 
After seeing the resurrected Jesus, however, James and Jesus' other brothers became Christian leaders. James later became a highly respected leader in the Jerusalem church. James also became an apostle, persevered through persecution, and even chaired the first Jerusalem council. It is assumed that James wrote his book around AD 60 prior to the Great Fire of Rome. James's letter was included in the nine epistles amidst the harsh persecution against the Christians from the Jews and then from the Roman Empire. On the same lines, James's letter was written during great difficulty in the early church. The book of James is similar to Proverbs in the Old Testament. James especially stressed that faith without action was a dead faith. James's letter was targeted at Christians who were living scattered due to the harsh persecution from the Roman Empire. Concerning this, James told them to accept hardship with joy. James thought that they were to keep their faith strong all the more and to be patient. James wished his fellow Christians hope for the eternal life and taught them to seek wisdom through faith as wisdom came only from God. James added that wealth and honor disappeared, but the only thing that lasted was eternal life. Second point. James advised to follow in the acts of Jesus and to practice faith. James advised the people to listen to God and to act accordingly. James furthermore added to be quick to obey God and to be slow to anger or in speech and also to receive God's words with meekness. James thought that the best way to live was by implementing God's words and looking after the orphans and widows and loving their brothers. James especially rebuked those who discriminated between the rich and poor. James stressed that not loving their neighbors as Christians was a sin and that if they did not serve the poor, they would be judged by God. This was partly a warning against the people who did not practice faith and abused justification by faith. Third point, James stressed the importance of having caution in our words through many examples. James stressed the importance of implementing faith into action and also advised them not to volunteer too easily to become teachers. James stressed the importance of taming the tongue through many examples. James firstly wrote that when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Secondly, although sheep are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Thirdly, although the tongue is a small part of the body, it makes great boasters. Fourthly, although all sorts of animals and creatures can be tamed, no human tongue can be tamed. As such, James taught the church members to use their tongue wisely for singing praise to God. James continued to teach to seek wisdom from God in heaven and then compared wisdom to lies. First point, James thought that boasting and not carrying out good deeds was a sin and that it was important to recognize this. James taught the church members not to allow among them. James clarified that the reason people vote was due to earthly greed. Thus, those who wished to befriend the world had to become God's enemy. James then taught how to avoid arguments. The first was to obey God and shut out the demons. 
Second was to be close to God and purify their hands and heart. Third was to repent from their sins and to lament. Fourth was to be humble. Babes was not to slander. James stressed that misfortune started from the tongue because words contain the heart. The tongue expresses what is in the heart, and this becomes the start of an argument. An arrogant heart and evil deeds are embedded in us by nature. We try to conceal this through pointless boasting and visual appearances. James taught to be ashamed of our sins and try hard to lament because of our sins. James added that pointless boasting was a sin, which needed to be realized. Fifth point, James stressed the importance of deeds alongside faith. The reason James stressed that faith without deeds was false faith. Was because there are many Christians who said they believed but did nothing to help their neighbors. James declared judgment on those who stored a great deal for themselves and did nothing for the poor. The rich who did this would be judged for their fortune that they gathered from evil. God would hear how they mistreated their workers and punish them. God would judge their lavish lifestyle. James then wrote about the faith to those who are poor and enduring persecution. James was not trying to discriminate or distinguish people according to whether they were rich or poor, but according to whether or not they obeyed. James taught to the church members to persevere as Jesus' second coming was near and that there would be blessing to those who keep their faith. James also taught them not to swear on earth. Lastly, James advised those who are being persecuted to pray. James told them that if they honestly prayed to God, God would listen. And James referenced Elijah's prayer as an example. James also told the church members to help those who were being led by false teachings and to lead them to the right path. Day 355 1 Peter 1-5 Citizens in the Kingdom of God Jesus who rose from the dead gave the disciples hope and mission and promised the Holy Spirit and commanded them to preach his love to all the nations. First point, Peter wrote that the prophets were able to prophesy from the abilities given by the Holy Spirit in order to testify Jesus. Peter's letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, were written amidst the growing persecution by the Roman Empire toward the Christians. Peter wrote these letters to Christians in order to encourage them and give them strength. In his first letter, the sins were suffering rebirth through the scriptures and hope. And for his second letter, the sins were wisdom through experience, growing through grace and wisdom of Christ, and wording of false teachings. Peter's first letter was for Christians scattered around. Peter addressed them as scattered foreigners. Peter told these people to be glad even during suffering. Peter outlined the reasons as to why they should be glad. The first was because of their hope, through Jesus' resurrection and the kingdom of God. The second was because they were under God's protection until the day of their eternal salvation. The third was because they had received eternal life and glory through Jesus Christ. Peter wrote that salvation through Jesus was mentioned prior to Jesus' birth by the prophets. They were able to prophesy from the abilities given by the Holy Spirit, and this in itself was a testament of Jesus Christ. Thus. Peter told the Christians 
to be holy in their daily lives. This was possible as God was their father and because God is holy. Peter also told them to have faith and hope in God and to love one another deeply. Second point, Peter referred to the Old Testament in order to teach about what being a Christian meant in the kingdom of God. Peter continued to teach Christians to grow and mature until the day of their salvation. He also told them to become unified with Jesus and to become citizens in the kingdom of God. Peter referred to the book of Isaiah and Psalm. Peter then taught them what citizenship in the kingdom of God meant. The citizens in the kingdom of God are those who are selected by God as recorded in Isaiah. They are holy citizens as recorded in Exodus. They are God's possessions also as recorded in Exodus. Third point. Peter taught that Christians were citizens in the kingdom of God and also that Christians are foreigners living on earth. Peter taught about how the church members had become God's people and about the relationships and role they were to take on. God's people were those who came to earth as foreigners and were placed on earth to glorify God and so they were to obey God all the more. Peter taught those who were slaves and their role. Peter then taught the roles of wives and then the husbands. Next, Peter taught the church members how to deal with the persecution. The first thing they were to do was to love one another consistently. The second was to not repay evil with evil. The third was to do more good deeds. The fourth was to spread the gospel even further despite the persecution. The reason Peter gave such advice to the church members was so that they could realize that the current persecution was temporary and that as citizens of the kingdom of God, they had hope. Fourth point, Peter stressed the benefits of a hardship and taught the members of the church how they were to live. Peter told the church members that the benefits of a hardship was that it enabled one to get rid of their old self and become renewed. Peter then taught them how they were to deal with a hardship. First, they were to pray at such times. Second, they were to love one another profoundly. Third, they were to serve with all their hearts. First, they were to participate in hardship and to always be glad. Fifth, hardship was a sign that judgment was approaching and so they were not to avoid it and to always choose God the Creator. In AD 64, the great fire of Rome occurred and Emperor Nero placed the blame on Christians. Because of this, Christians were persecuted for just being Christians. However, Peter told the church members to regard this as participating in the suffering for Christ. Peter taught them to perform more good deeds amidst this hardship and glorify God all the more. Fifth point, Peter told the church leaders to lead by example. To the Christians who were going through suffering, Peter gave the following teachings. The first, towards the elders and leaders, to them, Peter told them to read by example. The second was towards the young people. Peter told them to obey their leaders and to be humble. The third was for the church to not worry and to not fear. Peter gave loving advice to the church members and encouraged them as he ended his first letter. Peter wrote that he was currently spreading the gospel with Silas, who was a leader of the Jerusalem church and a companion to St. Paul during his second missionary journey. In addition, the mention of Babylon at the end of Peter's letter likely refers to the Roman church that was facing persecution by the Roman Empire. This was because Peter was spreading the gospel in Rome with Silas and Mark 
at the time of writing. And Timothy and Titus were Paul's sons in faith. Mark was likely Peter's son in faith. Day 356 to Peter 1 to 3. Teachings about Jesus' second coming. God promised eternal victory to the people who kept righteousness to the end for not giving up faith in spite of much temptation. First point, so that the truth of Jesus could be maintained after he died, Peter wrote his second letter to Peter. In Peter's second letter, Peter stressed not to be shaken by false teachers or surrounding temptations. Peter emphasized to grow and mature in the grace and wisdom of Jesus Christ. Peter revealed the reason as to why he wrote 1 and 2 Peter. Firstly, he wished for the church members to stand straight in faith. Secondly, he wished for them to be strong in faith even after he died. The death of Peter had been mentioned by Jesus beforehand. How Peter would glorify God through death? Second point, Peter testified the Son of God whom he met personally and also proclaimed Jesus' second coming so that the church members did not become tempted by false teachings, Peter once again stressed the second coming of Jesus. Peter was able to confidently testify Jesus' second coming, as he had heard and experienced God's voice personally. Furthermore, Peter knew the Old Testament that directed towards Jesus' second coming. These verses were not to be interpreted lightly or as one pleased. At the time of writing this, Peter knew that he did not have too long left to live. Thus, he all the more wished to tell the church members not to waver in their faith in Jesus. He believed that the gospel of Jesus Christ was beyond and above everything. Peter was a disciple of Jesus for three years, and so he was all the more able to testify Jesus, as well as Jesus' second coming. Third point, Peter strongly warned the false teachers of God's judgment that was to come. Peter warned once again of the false teachers. Peter outlined the characteristics of the false teachers and the false teachings. First, they would come into the church quietly among them, and then take the church members slowly to the false teachings. Second, they were the ones to perish after denying God. Third, they would seduce and tempt the church members for their own benefit, and then use the church members to earn money. Peter stressed that God would most certainly judge these people by sending them to hell or by an accident such as the time of the flood during Noah. Peter also mentioned the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah. As such, these evil people were bound to be punished by God. Peter warned strongly against these false teachers and told the church not to be tempted. Peter continuously stressed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the importance of the Bible in the church. Fourth point, Peter once again taught about Jesus' second coming. Peter confirmed that Jesus' second coming would indeed happen. This was a proclamation for the false teachers to hear. Peter then told them to remember the instant of the flood during Noah. Although the false teachers taught that the world would not end as it had not changed since creation, Peter wrote that the end would come when God judged the earth. Peter then mentioned the reason as to why Jesus' second coming was delayed. The first was because God's time and human time was different. Second, because God is waiting for humans to repent. Third, no one actually knew of the time of Jesus' second coming. Fifth point, 
Peter taught that we will realize the whole Bible fully when Jesus comes for the second time. Peter now wrote his final message. Peter concluded by teaching them to live holy until the final day and to work hard in order to stand tall before God. Peter also warned against the people who would read his letter and misinterpret it intentionally. Peter blessed them and prayed for them to be with Jesus Christ and then ended his letter. Day 357 Jude Battle for Faith Jude exhorted Christians to keep principle and to fight the righteous fight by participating in Jesus' victory. First point Jude, the brother of St. James, introduced himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. James and Jude, who were Jesus' brothers, became the leaders of the early church and representative members of the first generation of the Gospel era. They each left records in order to strengthen the Church of God. Jude prayed for mercy, peace, and love for the second generation of the Gospel era, who were experiencing a great deal of hardship. Second point, the book of Jude has much similarity with 2 Peter chapter 2. First, Jude taught the church to fight against the evil in order to keep faith. Second, Jude proclaimed God's judgment against the false teachers. Third, Jude stressed that Christians had already succeeded through the cross of Jesus and so could persevere. Third point, Jude warned that the false teachers would surely be judged by God. Jude wrote about God's judgment of false teachers by referencing the Old Testament. First, God had destroyed all the Exodus generation, excluding Moses, Joshua, and Caleb as they did not have faith. Second, God judged the angels who were arrogant. Third, God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, which was full of idolatry. Fourth point, Jude criticized idolatry by referring to Cain, Balaam, and Korah's forces. First, the evil spirit had caused Cain to murder his brother Abel. Second, the evil spirit wished for the church members to fall into evil. Third, the evil spirit built Korah's forces against Moses and Aaron. As such, Jude listed the history of evil and proclaimed judgment. He then advised the church to always remember the teachings of the apostles, who directed them towards Jesus Christ. Fifth point, Jude taught to have mercy on those who were being led by false teachers and to help them turn from their ways. Jude taught the church how they could protect themselves from evil. First, they were to root themselves strongly in faith. Second, they were to pray with the Holy Spirit. Third, they were to protect themselves in God's love. Fourth, they were to wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ. Jude moreover taught the church to have mercy on false teachers and to help them see the right path. Day 358, 1 John 1 to 5. God is love. A Christian's righteous life is to sincerely love one's neighbors as God loved us first. First point John lived through the matter of 200 Christian leaders following the great fire of Rome in AD 64 and spent the rest of his life spreading the gospel to second-generation Christians. Many first-generation Christian leaders, including Paul and Peter, were martyred following the great fire of Rome in AD 64 under the Roman Empire. John, however, was not killed but exiled. John lived the longest out of the first-generation leaders and he took care of Jesus' mother, Mary, and his own mother, 
and moreover encouraged second-generation leaders to stand strong in their faith. John, in his old days, became a responsible leader in the church and then spent a long time thinking and reflecting about Jesus. John was able to realize that Jesus died because of his love for us. Thus, John proclaimed that God is love. In the Old Testament, Moses recorded five books, and in the New Testament, John also recorded five books, including John's Gospel 1, 2, and 3 John, as well as Revelation. The Bible started with Moses' records and ended with John's records. John wrote 1 John with the aim of expressing God's love from creation and how God had three forms, including Jesus and the Holy Spirit. John first proclaimed that God is the light and taught the church members to act as the light. John wrote that when we act as the light and when we confess our sins, those are the times God's holiness is revealed. John went into depths about the sin and confessing our sins before God and the importance of doing so. Second point, John wrote to the second generation Christians with the heart of a father to his children. Although John was Jesus' youngest disciple, he became a father-like figure to the second generation Christians, especially following the great fire of Rome. John took on the task of teaching the second generation Christians about Jesus' gospel. With the heart of a father, John revealed the reason as to why he wrote 1 John. John taught the second generation Christians to always repent and find forgiveness in Jesus. John then taught the church to keep God's words, and that this was the way to God's love and wisdom. John then told the church to love one another. John furthermore taught them to be cautious of teachings against God's words. The first of these false teachings was to not love the world and to stay away from the Antichrist. John wrote that Christians were those who lived in God's light. The evil spirits and false teachers quietly came into the church and pretended to be one of the Christians, but deep inside they denied God and tempted others. However, if the church members kept their faith strong, they would be able to stay in God's light and to always live in God. Third point, John taught that loving brothers in Christ was possible due to the love of Jesus Christ. John hoped that the church members would live as God's children and then taught them what this entailed. Firstly, God's children were unknown by the world. Secondly, God's children were those who would be with Jesus until Jesus came again. Thirdly, God's children did not commit crimes. John used the example of Cain to tell of a man who did not love his brother. John taught that those who did righteous acts and those who loved his brother, both were God's people. However, if one did not have love, they did not belong to God. Therefore, as God's children, Christians were to love one another, as brothers and sisters, as Jesus had loved us in this way. John wrote that if they loved one another, they would be able to receive from God what they asked for. Fourth point, John proclaimed that God is love. In John's Gospel, John had already testified that Jesus came to this world as a man. John ultimately proclaimed that God is love. John followed this up by teaching the church to love one another. In 1 John, love is a recurring theme. In chapter 4, John wrote that we were to love because God loves us. The Bible is a book that tells us of God's love. It tells of who God is. We are able to learn about love and obedience through Abraham and Isaac's offering on Mount Moriah. 
This sacrifice was preparation for God and Jesus' cross. Through Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, he was able to find out God's will. Jesus was able to obey and take on the cross because he knew of God's love. God had made us all his children by sacrificing his one and only son. Jesus explained that the cross was God's way and truth and life. Thus, God showed us that He is love. If only we believe in Jesus, we can become God's children. And only through Jesus can we go to God. This is also because Jesus is love. Fifth point, John declared that Jesus Christ is the Son of God through water, blood, and the Holy Spirit. Now, John taught about faith. First, anyone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God is God's child and through God's love. A Christian can defeat the world. Second, the proof of Jesus lies in water, blood, and the Holy Spirit. Third, through Jesus, we are able to gain eternal life. Fourth, through Jesus' cross, we are given the right to pray to God at any time and have faith that God listens. John taught the church members to pray for one another with love as they had received God's love. John ended his letter by warning them against idolatry. Day 359 2 John and 3 John Harmony between love and truth like chaos. John exhorted believers to unveil the cloak of darkness with faith in Jesus to imitate what is good and to walk into the light of love. First point, John wrote a joyful letter to those who lived for the truth. In 2 John, John wrote about loving one's brothers, following in the truth that is Jesus Christ, as well as how to deal with those who rejected Jesus. John wrote that it pleased his heart to see those who followed in the truth. Second point, John told the church members to be cautious of the Antichrist. At the time of John's second letter, Christians were suffering from persecution from the Jews and also from the Roman Empire, which made it difficult for them to keep their faith. What made the situation worse was that evil spirits and false teachers came into their community. Regarding this, John told them to always be cautious of the Antichrist. Third point, John wrote a letter of thanks to Gaius, who opened his house to missionaries and apostles. The reason John wrote three John was in order to praise Gaius, who opened his house to serve the missionaries and apostles. Second, John wanted to encourage Gaius to continue his good job. Third, he rebuked the arrogance and evil deeds of dire traffic. Fourth, John wanted to recommend Demetrius. Fourth point, the reason John encouraged Gaius to continue his good deeds was due to Jesus' teachings. John expressed a great deal of pride and great fleas towards Gaius, who served the missionaries and apostles. John encouraged Gaius to continue his good deeds as per the teachings in the Old Testament. Fifth point, John taught that it was right for everyone to work together to spread the gospel. John taught that everyone's differences were God's blessing and that it was the role of humans to collaborate in order to glorify God. The Bible records many instances of collaborations. The working of the seven leaders of the early church was a collaborative project. Paul's missionary team was also a collaborative project. Gaius, the missionary team and the apostles was also a collaboration. Day 360, Revelation 1-3 to Second generation Christians and the seven churches The exaltation of the Holy Spirit led believers into victory. 
even rebuked towards the churches, is a gift of love by the Holy Spirit. First point. John met Jesus for the first time in Galilee, and then again 60 years later in the island of Patmos. Among Jesus' twelve disciples, Peter and Andrew were brothers, and James and John were brothers. Among the disciples, John was the youngest and was always beside Jesus. John was also the disciple whom Jesus asked to look after his mother when he was on the cross. When Jesus appeared before them after the resurrection, he predicted John's missionary that was to come. The last book that John wrote, Revelation, was written amidst the growing persecution of the Roman Empire against the Christians. John was sent to the island of Patmos, and here God showed John visions, which were recorded in Revelation. John therefore was able to meet Jesus again in the island of Patmos, 60 years since meeting Jesus for the first time. Second point, John in Revelation sang the song of victory of Jesus Christ and the church. The reason John wrote Revelation was in order to encourage and console the second generation Christians who were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Due to the growing hardship, there were those who gave up on their faith, and John encouraged them to have hope. It can be difficult to understand the record in Revelation. However, God said that there will be blessings to those who read it and keep what is written in it. God gave these words in order to encourage and console his people. Revelation can be summarized as the pre-received song of victory. Third point, John, per God's order, wrote to the second generation Christians who were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. John wrote Revelation not as his book, but as a record given by Jesus Christ, and he clearly explained this. Through John, God spoke about the seven churches in Asia who were keeping their faith despite persecution. The persecution of the Roman Empire against the Christians at the time expanded beyond Rome and even to the island of Patmos where John was exiled. Jesus came to see John in Patmos and showed him four visions. The first vision was of Jesus, the Lamb of God, seated next to God in heaven. The second was God's temple and ark. The third was the seven people trumpets the new heavens and the new earth. The fourth was Jesus' yearning for his second coming. Fourth point, John wrote his letter in hopes that it will console and encourage Christians who were suffering from persecution under the Roman Empire. John recorded the words given by Jesus and sent the letter out to the churches in order to console and encourage them. The church in Ephesus was persevering through lies. The church in Smyrna was persevering through the persecution from the Jews. The church in Thyatira was keeping their faith and church strong. The church in Sardis had members who kept the church pure. The church in Philadelphia was also persevering through hardship. As such, the second generation Christians was trying their absolute best to persevere through hardship. Jesus encouraged them, but he also rebuked them for their misunderstandings. This was because rebuking also comes from love. Fifth point, John wrote praises, rebuke, and encouragement to the seven churches. John wrote to the seven churches. The words here contain God's messages in the form of praises, rebuke, and encouragement. The words of encouragement and rebuke were equally given to all seven churches for different reasons, but as a whole, they were practical advice against the persecution and the false teachings. Day 361, Revelation 4-7 Seven Seals and Visions from creation until now, praise echoes from the throne of God 
and Jesus sits as the righteous judge. First point, John was led by the Holy Spirit to see God seated in heaven. John was led by the Holy Spirit to see heaven. What John saw first was God seated in heaven. Second, John saw the elders surrounding God. Third, John saw the seven spirits of God. Fourth, John saw the four creatures singing God's praises. Fifth, the elders sang praises to God. Second point, John saw Jesus being offered as God's sacrificial lamb on the cross, and then 60 years later, he saw Jesus seated next to God in heaven. John was able to see a vision of God seated in heaven and Jesus seated next to God. John was able to see Jesus shedding blood for humans and then 60 years later, he was able to see Jesus seated in heaven next to God. The next thing John saw was the scroll. An angel asked, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? However, no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. Because of this, John lamented loudly. Then a figure came who was able to open it. The figure was the root of David and God's young lamb, Jesus Christ. Third point. The seven visions John saw referred to Jesus' teachings about the final day and the punishment. In Revelation chapters 6 to 16, we come to read about seals, trumpets, and bowls. The Bible has several references to seals. The first is when Pharaoh gave Joseph his signet ring to grant him power. The second is when Darius unknowingly used his seal in order to put Daniel in the lion's den. The third is when the nobles of Persia forced the king to seal the mouth of the den with his signet ring so that Daniel's situation could not be changed. The fourth is when Esther used the seal of Xerxes to save the Jews. The fifth was when Nehemiah made a binding agreement with the people and affixed the seals of the leaders, Levites, and priests. The sixth was when Jesus' tomb was guarded by putting a seal on the stone. After God's judgment, we come to read about the new heavens and the new earth. First point, God's young lamb starts to remove the seals for judgment. Finally, God's young lamb Jesus Christ began removing the seals. John witnessed the opening of the seven seals and discovered that this was like the sign that would appear when Jesus would come at the end of the age, mentioned approximately 60 years ago. The first seal was of a white horse that symbolized war. The second seal was of a fiery red horse that symbolized killings between people. The third seal was of a black horse that symbolized earthquakes and droughts. The fourth seal was of a pale horse that symbolized famine and plague. The fifth seal symbolized religious persecution. The sixth seal symbolized judgment by natural disaster. The seventh and final seal symbolized the silence before a storm that predicted the plagues to come, that afterwards was followed by the seven trumpets. Fifth point, 144,000 is a symbolic number and those who have been selected by God will become forces no one can come against. God selected 144,000 to place seals on their heads. However, this number is symbolic, and no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Day 362, Revelation 8-11 Seven angels and seven trumpets 
Although disasters struck every time the seven angels blew the trumpets, respectively, God was with the people chosen by him. First point. Before the seven trumpets are blown, the prayers of the church members are heard by God. Thus, the young man Jesus Christ became the final seal, and then there was a silence in heaven before the seven angels stood before God to blow their trumpets. Before the trumpets were blown, the church members prayed to God. The seven trumpets which follow the seven seals can be found in Ezekiel, and this was God showing his judgment. Second point. The seven trumpets remind us of the ten plagues leading up to Exodus. Following the seven seals, the seven trumpets began to sound. The Bible has many references to the trumpet. The first was the sound of the trumpet on Mount Sinai. This symbolized the God's presence. The second was the sound of reminding the Jubilee. The third was the sound of the trumpet in Jericho. The fourth was the sound of the trumpet by Gideon and his 300 warriors. The fifth was when the returned captives re-established the temples and blew the trumpet to offer sacrifice to God. The sixth was the sound of the trumpet in Revelation with the seven angels. Now, to look into the record in Revelation, the seven trumpets came as a stronger force than the seven seals, and this reminds us of the ten plagues leading up to Exodus. The Israelites who left Egypt and then established a kingdom of priests were now to enter the eternal kingdom of God. However, before doing so, the believers had to suffer with the non-believers. The angels started to blow their trumpets. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star rising like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the spring of the water. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned the down. However, the plague had not come to an end. Instead, the eagle and angels came to one of a bigger plague. Revelation reveals the true sin of hell. When the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, John saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. Despite all of this, the people still did not repent and continued to worship idols. When the seventh trumpet sounded, God's judgment continued. Many people died, and they experienced the pain beyond death. Those who are not with God will not be able to avoid God's judgment. Third point. Between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, God told John to eat a small scroll and to prophesy to the nation. Between the sixth and seventh trumpet, a strong angel appeared with a small scroll. However, the angel told John not to record but to seal it. John obeyed. Then there followed a warning for the plague yet to come. When the seventh trumpet sounded, it would bring the biggest pain, and here God's secret would be unraveled. In other words, when Christians go through the most painful persecution, God was to unveil his history. When a voice from heaven was heard, John was to eat the scroll and prophesy to the nation. First point, between the sixth and seventh trumpets, God told John to carry out a few tasks. God told John to go measure the temple of God and the altar with its washpots. Second, he was to appoint two witnesses to prophesy for 1,260 days. Third, these two witnesses would stand before God. They will be martyred 
and people will be joyous because of them. After three and a half days, they will resurrect and a big earthquake will kill many people. Fifth point, when the final trumpet was blown, John was able to see God's ark in heaven. Finally, the last trumpet sounded to warn of the final plague. When the elders heard it, they praised God. With this, heaven was revealed and John saw the temple opening and the ark inside. Not too long was left before God's kingdom would emerge. Day 363 Revelation 12 to 15 144,000 song. To those who suffered from persecution but strove to keep their faith, God's consolation and the crown of righteousness awaited. First point. The second interlude in Revelation is the battle between Jesus Christ and Satan. Revelation chapters 12 to 14 show the interlude of the battle between Jesus Christ and Satan. Three visions were shown. The first was the woman and dragon. The second was the two beasts. And the third was the song of the 144,000 and the three angels. The first was the woman and the dragon, and here a woman gave birth. The woman was shouting as she gave birth to a child to rule the world. Second, a dragon appeared that tried to swallow up the child. Third, when the child was born, the mother took him to the desert to raise him. Following on, we see a dragon that was Satan eliminated from heaven. First, Satan the big dragon was driven away to earth. Second, when there was a victory in heaven, there was the sound of joy. However, Satan took evil to the earth and the seas. Because of this, there were some people who were still facing persecution on earth. And Satan knew he did not have it too long, he persecuted the people all the more. Satan moreover persecuted the church that was the woman who gave birth to the child. However, the woman was able to receive protection. The woman was able to nurture her child and protect it. This symbolized how God would protect the church. Satan then tried to fight against the remaining children of the woman. Second point. John saw a beast coming up from the sea, and this beast was persecuting God's people, but was at the same time prized by the people of the earth. Next was the vision of the two beasts. First, the beast from the sea appeared that was given powers by Satan. This beast came to conquer the world for three and a half years. Although the beast persecuted the people who belonged to God, the people of earth praised the beast. Thus, John told the people to keep their faith until the very end. Second, the next beast looked like the young man, but it made the people bow down to the first beast that was set up as an idol. Third point, John saw the vision of 144,000 people singing and the three angels spreading their message. Now the last vision unveils, and this was of the 144,000 people singing and the three angels spreading their message. On the foreheads of the 144,000, the name of the young lamb and God were written. However, those who belonged to Satan had the sign of Satan on them. The 144,000, however, were pure people who followed in the way of the young man and those who did not lie and were without fault. Next was the message from the three angels. The message of the first angel was to praise God on all the earth. The second message was that Babylon would fall because of its faults. The third message was that those who served Satan would be punished, and so Christians were to keep their faith until the very end. Fourth point, John saw God's judgment being implemented through seven balls. 
John saw the seven cells, the seven trumpets, and the message of the three angels. Then John saw the vision of the seven bowls. These were all signs of God's judgment that was to come. First, the end will come for the people who received Satan's sign and those who worshipped idols. Second, all the creatures in the sea would die. Third, the river will turn to blood. Fourth, the sun will burn the people. Fifth, the people will not repent despite the plague and suffering. Sixth, the river will dry up. Seventh, Babylon will fall. Fifth point, John saw the temple offering and the seven angels implementing the final plague. Now the final plague was prepared. Here, God's people praised God. John saw the seven angels taking up their cities. They prepared for the final plague. It was the moment that God judged those that did not have faith in him. It was also the moment of God's righteousness. At the moment of God's anger, Christians would not be met with plagues but seeing of God forever. Day 364, Revelation 16-18 The Fall of Babylon and the Foreseen Future God will judge the entire world with justice and righteousness at the time of the last judgment and will reveal that He alone is the sovereign. First point, during the plague of the seven trumpets, a third of the population was affected, but the seven bowls of God's wrath was extended to the whole world. The seven bowls of wrath finally unraveled following the seven seals, seven trumpets, and the three visions. The seven angels poured out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. This was incomparable to the seven trumpets beforehand. During the plague of the seven trumpets, a third of the population was affected, but this time it covered the whole earth. However, this plague did not affect everyone. It only affected those who had the seal of the beasts and Satan on them, and those who did not repent. Eventually, Babylon, which symbolized all empires, collapsed, and New Jerusalem was established. The start of Genesis and the end of Revelation shows the beginning and the end of the universe. This is beyond the scale imaginable to humans. However, God is bigger than all of this. Second point. The third interlude in Revelation is the destruction of Babylon. Revelation chapters 17 to 19 verse 5 unravels the third interlude in Revelation. The prostitute and the beast which symbolized God's judgment of Babylon and Babylon's destruction. The prostitute was sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The prostitute symbolized Babylon and also the Roman Empire that was persecuting God's people. This showed that God would destroy Babylon and also Rome for their sins. Although the prostitute seemingly represented an entire kingdom ruled by Satan, the end for them would be nothing but destruction by God. Third point. The angel told John not to fear and to watch the woman and the beast perish. When John saw that the prostitute was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, he was greatly astonished. However, the angel came to John and told him not to be afraid and to watch the woman perish in the end. Although it appeared that the beast was gaining all the glory of the earth, Jesus Christ remains the King forever, and those who follow in Jesus will share the eternal glory while the evil perish. First point, God's angel proclaimed the destruction of Babylon. Now, God's angel loudly proclaimed the fall of Babylon. This was a shout to claim their destruction 
along with all the kings and merchants of Babylon. After the angel's proclamation, John hears another voice from heaven. The voice confirmed to John that Babylon's sins were alarmingly enormous and that they would be punished according to their sins. It was also a warning not to participate in Babylon's sins. Fifth point. The angel told God's people to be glad about the fall of Babylon. The reason Babylon was destroyed was first because they ruled the earth as if it belonged to them. Second, they tempted people into doing evil. Third, they persecuted God's people. Thus, the angel told God's people to be glad about their fall. When the people of the earth saw that Babylon fell, the merchants of the earth lamented. These were the people who had profited from Babylon's accomplishments by trading with them. At last, the final judgment on Babylon was declared. This was the declaration that Babylon would not be able to return. It would become like a rock that sinks to the bottom of the sea. A365 Revelation 19-22 God's joy woven into all things. In the new heaven and the new earth, where there are no more tears or pain, God who will renew all things and his people will be together. First point. The fourth interlude in Revelation tells of the final victory. Revelation chapter 19 verses 6 to 20 shows the new heavens and new earth and the final victory. John was able to see the destruction of the prostitute and the beast and then see God's people praising him. The elders glorified God and sang for the whole world to praise God. Now, the fourth interlude in Revelation unravels. The young lamb's wedding is prepared. The rope one for the wedding was the rope of the kingdom of God's people. The people attending the wedding stood with the angels to praise God. The angel told John to record how those who attended the wedding were blessed by God. Following this, Jesus Christ the King appears. Then, the complete victory of Jesus is shown. Second point. John wrote that Christians with Christ will act as a king for 1,000 years. John wrote that Satan will be punished for 1,000 years. During the 1,000 years, Christ and Christians will act as a king. During this time, God will punish Satan and his forces, and God's waters will make Satan perish. After 1,000 years, they will receive their final punishment. Afterwards, Satan will be thrown into a fire pit and remain there forever. On the final day of judgment, the existing heavens and earth will disappear. All will be carried out as it is recorded. Those who are not recorded in the book of eternal life will be thrown down to hell. On the final day of judgment, first, there is an end for individuals. And this is about the individual's death, resurrection, and eternal life. Second, there is a historical end, and this is about the Southern Year Kingdom. Jesus is the second coming, judgment, heaven, and hell. And third, there is the universal end, and this is about the new heavens and the new earth. Third point, God will renew the world and create new heavens and new earth. Now we come to the climax of Revelation. All plagues and wars will come to an end, and there will no longer be any tears or lamenting. God will renew the world and everything will become new. God has in store a holy land, the New Jerusalem, that will come from heaven. God's people who have endured the persecution for a long time will be able to enter the New Jerusalem and live their eternal life given by God. God showed John the new heavens and the new earth through visions. 
God will be with the people in New Jerusalem, and it will be a place without tears, death, lament, or pain. It will be a holy temple with great high walls, with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gate. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, as well as the names of the apostles of the Lamb. The New Jerusalem is measured by the angels. The materials for construction can be found in Revelation. Fourth point: God showed John the new creation of the restored Garden of Eden. God showed John through a vision his new creation, and this was the restoration of the Garden of Eden. When God first created the world, God's heart was pleased. When we see the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we can see how God's vision of the new heavens and new earth is the greatest blessing. In Genesis chapters one and two, God's creation of the universe is recorded. In Revelation chapters twenty-one and twenty-two, God's new heaven and new earth is recorded. Fifth point: John records Jesus' heart. Towards the second generation Christians, Jesus truly wanted to come to them. As John closes Revelation, John records Jesus's heart towards Christians. Jesus's heart is that he truly wants to come to us. This was said to the seven churches and to us today. Thus, Revelation is a book of joy and blessing. When John prays the angel. Who brought to him this message? The angel told John that he was only a messenger, and that John was to praise God. Now John ends on this note: First, the time is near. Second, each person will be rewarded for their behavior. Third, the people were told to come forth to receive the water of life. This clarified that Jesus gave this message. As John concluded the revelation, he warned all those reading to keep God's command. John delivered Jesus' heart as he ended his book.